Let's open with prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us, uh, for showing us what an amazing God you are. Uh, be with us as we study your word. Open our eyes and our hearts and our minds uh, to recognize the amazing <clears throat> things that you've done for us and to uh, to appreciate those great blessings and uh, to be able to communicate those blessings to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So the format that we're going to follow, this is we're going to go um, 24 weeks. I tried to squeeze it down smaller, and I just couldn't do it without, um, you know, cutting. Kind of. Dr. Heck squeezed it down into an hour, um, and I can't even squeeze it down past 24 hours. So, <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is we're going to. Um, we're going to read the passage and then um, we're going to get work through the questions as far as we can. Any questions that we don't get to, we're just going to drop those and, and, and pick it up next week with the next section. Okay? So feel free to read the rest of those questions that we don't get to. Um, you can, uh, you know, feel free to answer them, feel free to discuss them with others. Um, you know, outside of the classroom. Uh, if you have questions about anything, you want to give me a call, feel free to do that. Um, those of you with internet can go online. We're going to try to continue the discussion on there with anybody that can't be here tonight. Um, and so just lots of different ways to continue, but I do want to keep on schedule. Now, there will be weeks that we're off, so it's going to actually be more than 24 weeks because uh, this is going to end up going over Christmas and and I realize I've only taken a week of vacation so far this year, and so I'm probably going to take another week sometime um, uh. <laughs> fairly soon. I know. Um, and uh, so the, there will probably be another eight week weeks this year. Or nine. Uh, what's that? Eight or nine weeks vacation this year. Yeah. <laughs> so All the abuse you take. Well, what is the one? Because you guys just got a sweatshirt. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I can take it. <laughs> My Bible. Bible study about <coughs> <coughs> oh, Seminary professor, as you say, never go into battle without your weapon. <laughs> Alright, would someone like to start reading? It's, a, it's pretty long, we're going to read 1-1 um, one, one through 2-3. Two, um, so, if someone would like to read just a, a part of it, um, and when you when you don't want to read anymore, you can stop, and somebody else can pick up the ball. Could we could we go a verse, a verse, a verse, a verse, a verse? Um, if you want, and anybody that doesn't want to read can just say pass. Keep going. We can do it that way. Okay, That's fine. I'll start. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the, of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And it was evening, and there was morning one day. And God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters, to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. I pass on. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seeds bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetable plants bearing seeds according to their kind, and the trees bearing fruit with seeds and according to their kind. And God saw it, and it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day then god said let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day and night 
and let them be for signs for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and it was so God made the two great lights the greater light govern the day and the lesser light govern the night he made the stars God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on earth and govern the day and the night to separate the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good there was evening and there was morning a fourth day and God said <clears throat> the water team with living creatures and let birds fly <clears throat> above the earth across the expanse of the sky so God created the great creatures of the sea and every and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good God them and said be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth and it was evening and there was morning the fifth day okay. <clears throat> and God said let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds livestock creatures that move along the ground and wild animals each according to its kind was so god made the wild animals according to their kinds the livestock according to their kinds and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds and god saw that it was good then god said let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over ev every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth and God said behold I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit you shall have them for food 30 and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground everything that has the breath of life in I give every green plant for food and it was so God saw all that he had made and it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array by the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing so on the seventh day he rested from all his work and God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. All right. So, <clears throat> there you go. The most controversial chapter in the whole Bible. <coughs> which is pretty kind of sad, really, because um, <clears throat> I'm thinking the resurrection of the dead, um, you know, that sort of thing ought to be more controversial. But it's not. Um, so we'll kind of jump into that. But first of all, what did God create out of? What, what was the material that he created or that he used and um, what tool did he use to create that? I could be wrong. <laughs> it won't be the last time. <laughs> he created it out of nothing. Created it out of nothing. Exactly. All right. Ding. Ding. <laughs> Ding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so there's an old joke. That, <clears throat> um, you probably heard me say this one before, but it's one of my favorites. Um, the that man decides that, you know, with all of our scientific uh, accomplishments and everything, that we don't really need God. God um, anything that that He can do, can do, and, and that, and <laughs> and so God's all right, fine. Um, let's have a contest, and and man says, <clears throat> um, uh, 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 or God says, uh, or why don't you create life? Okay, this is pretty simple, right? And uh, and some man says, okay, well we take some dirt here, and and God says, hold on a minute, get your own dirt. <laughs> That's cute. So, so he he created everything out of nothing, 
All right. Um, we can do all kinds of amazing things, but we need something to start with. Um, and um, and so, what tool did he use to do that? His words. His word. He spoke. He said, and it happened. All right. The word of God is powerful enough to bring all creation into existence. All right. This is powerful stuff. And when we talk about the Bible being the Word of God, it's the same Word. All right? It's powerful. Stuff. And God uses it to accomplish amazing things. And, and if, you, if you take one thing away from this whole chapter, more important than, than the, the process and the, the, you know, all the questions about time and, and all that kind of stuff, is the question of how did God do it? when you get right down to it, what did he use? And the answer is his word. And where that's important, it's because his word is so powerful and it still affects our lives today. It still changes the world today. It still brings life where there was death. Cassie and I had a really long talk about this last week coming home from singing angels. It was really kind of cool because not only did she agree that you can't make anything you know there's nothing that you can make not a flower a petal nothing but scientifically you can't destroy anything either you can only change it but you can't destroy it yeah yeah the uh, law of conservation of matter and energy mm -hmm. that you can change things but you can't you can't cause things to cease to exist you can't cause things to come into existence um, except for by changing one thing and something else so yeah yeah there's no matter we, we each come up with something you know oh you can't you can make you can burn it and turn it into carbon you can't destroy it you can do this it was a really neat conversation but it, it was neat that you could say you can't do anything but you can destroy anything either yeah yeah but God actually brought into existence where there was nothing mm -hmm. all right um, so <clears throat> it says in the beginning he created the heavens and the earth right what about everything else He created everything else. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So this expression, the heavens and the earth, <coughs> all right, that is a, it's a Hebrew expression. It means everything. Okay. So everything that's on or under the earth, you know, it's sort of this stuff. Okay. And everything that's above the earth, you know, up in the sky or, you know, or we would say out in space and, you know, and everything else. In the beginning, God created everything so this this expression heavens and the earth it doesn't just mean god created earth god created heaven all right and then that's it and and what about everything else or you know how's that in the beginning god created everything okay um so <clears throat> you know i'm gonna I'm skip this next question and get back to it in just a second um which persons of the trinity were involved in creation and I'm just going to um, pull up John 1, 1 and 2. But the first paragraph, scriptures say spirit. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Um, in, in, yeah, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 2. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. All right. So we already have, there's the Holy Spirit mentioned right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, He was with God in the beginning, and actually uh, going to verse 3, through Him all things were made, without Him nothing was made that has been made. All right, who's the Word? Jesus. Jesus. All right, Jesus, and and we and just for clarification, if you jump down to John 1, 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so there, just in case you were wondering, um, the Word is, is Jesus. Um, and so, so there we've got, so interestingly, <laughs> we have the Holy Spirit we mentioned and we have Jesus mentioned, right? But who do we normally think of when we think of, of creation? God. The Father. <laughs> He's the only one that's not mentioned, right? 
that's implied. Any mm-hmm. any time that you see God being spoken of, the Father's just automatically included in there. And 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 the funny thing is, everybody seems to get that. Nobody ever questions the Father's involvement in in creation, um, even though he's not actually mentioned. But it's I mean, it's implied. It, it there's no. It's not that that the Father was went oh. Son, Holy Spirit, you guys go do that. I've got better things to do or something. Okay. Um, so, and then uh, the next question, notice the Spirit's connection with water. <coughs> the first place the Holy Spirit's mentioned, and he's mentioned it was hovering over the certain waters. And the word they're hovering, um, probably better um, translation word would be like brooding, um, the way that a, a, a mother hen <coughs> broods over her chicks. It's a. It's not just like a helicopter, okay. Um, but he's he's there, like involved and in, in caring and loving and 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 stuff like that. Um, it's a very you know sort of sense of concern and and, and care. All right. Um, and so then, where else does the Bible show water imagery with the Spirit of God? When Jesus was baptized. All right. Baptism of Jesus. Anywhere else? <coughs> Interesting thing about the Holy Spirit. If you look at all the different places in the Bible where the Holy Spirit is mentioned, now there may be one or two exceptions that, I, that I'm not thinking of, but usually when the Spirit is described, He's described as being poured out. Mm-hmm. Right? So, everywhere that I can think of, and I, I, I might, there might be one or two exceptions to this, but the Spirit is connected in some way with water in it. Either this sort of, you know, pouring out or, or something like that, or um, connected with baptism, or, or irrigation connected with water, right? So then, which of course is is really relevant when you're talking about, um, when are talking about baptism, um, that we should be, not be surprised that the Holy Spirit is, <coughs> is um, you know, closely connected with this concept of baptism. He's all about the water. Right? So, all right. All this stuff about um, age of the earth and age of the universe, all right? Um, So now I'm going to jump back, and and really a lot of this hinges on the question, um, Mm -hmm. the one that we skipped, did God create the heavens and the earth before or after the first day? I was looking at that. It looks like if you say heavens and earth, mm-hmm. because it talked about heaven and there was morning a second day, but I'm not sure if that's. I I, I, um, I don't know. All right. Well, do you mean the I'm heavens and the before, earth? That means uh, everything. That's what he said. Oh, well then. Yeah. Well, I just I'll wanted to clarify. There you yeah. go. I went standing forward, but I don't know. Okay. All right. Yeah. This is the big question. Now I'm going to tell you right now that I'm going to present you with a whole bunch of different things, and then I, I very firmly believe in teaching people how to think and not what to think. And so here's what I'm going to do, and, and you're probably not going to like it. Um, <laughs> All right. But, well, then we won't. <laughs> 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 All right. Right. But I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna present you with with different ideas, and different and why the different um, groups tell what they tell, <laughs> and I'm gonna let you make up your own mind of which one's right. All right. And if you're not sure, that's okay too. All right. Um, and in fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna back up and tell you a little bit about me, and and where I am with all of this. And, and there's probably somebody that's watching right now or, or is going to see this at some other point that's going to like write a nasty blog post about me, okay? <laughs> um, but I have to be honest and I have to just, according to my personal integrity, I need to, um, I need to be straight with you sort of where I'm at with all this, okay? Um, when, in, <clears throat> um, when I was in like grade school and stuff like that, um, I didn't really think a lot about, you know, sort of age of the earth and all that kind of stuff. I believe... Um, Genesis talked about you know days and stuff and and stuck with the pretty um, literal understanding but I didn't really you know give it much thought and um, 
And then I heard about like evolution, man coming from apes, and all that kind of stuff, and that all sounded pretty ridiculous to me. And um, and and my parents told me that's that's not true. Don't believe that stuff. And um, and then I got into high school, and and, <coughs> and they about um, this concept that really kind of got my attention, <coughs> and that was the 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 term is ontogeny recalage phylogeny. And what that means is that if you w look at um, a developing human embryo, a, a, a child in the womb at different stages, that it looks a lot like different animals that are in various developmental stages. And they say you could actually, the argument was is that you can trace evolution by looking at the development of the embryo. That it's sort of, in a sense, is sort of evolving through all these mm -hmm. different phases until it's fully human. <clears throat> and I went, wow, that's pretty amazing. Um, well, then I, later on, I looked into it more, um, and like when I was in seminary, and, and, and I found out that, well, those resences are pretty superficial. Um, like where they go, oh, look here, you know, uh, fetuses actually have gills, you know, like fish. Well, they're not really gills. It's actually the jawbone forming. <laughs> they're not gills. Um, it, it sort of looks like it if you look at it and, and someone said, look, it looks like gills. And you go, yeah, it kind of does. The same way that like if you look at it and, and, and if, if you're ever cloud watching with me, I'll say, look, that looks like a dragon because they all look like to me, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, and I'll go, look, there's the eye, and, and stuff like that, and you'll go, okay, all right, so, um, and now, because they've sort of studied human development more, they've sort of thrown out that argument, but it was pretty compelling at the time, and, um, and, and so I'd, I'd heard a lot of different things, and, um, and, and, and I was really struggling with this because I knew that um, that the sort of not entirely official but pretty official line in in, in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod was uh, what we call young earth creationism and um, and in fact I was um, it was when I was dating my wife who attended a Missouri Synod school and is trained as a Lutheran school teacher and, and all that um, and I said, no, I'm really struggling with this because I really, I don't know where I stand. I don't know. I can definitely say, yes, this is my position. All right. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to have to kind of make a vow to uphold these teachings and, and I'm, I'm not sure that I can do that, um, in good conscience. And, and <laughs> she says, well, you better figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> He's great. Uh -uh. Um, so when I got to seminary, I started reading. And I worked at the library, which was convenient, um, because I had access to lots and lots of books. And, and I'd be shelving books, you know, and I'd, and I'd go, oh, what's that? And, then, you know, and, um, and so I, I had a, you know, if you ever look at the list of books that I checked out, it, it's pretty long. Um, because, I, and, and so I read uh, books about young earth creation, and I read books about evolution and, and all kinds of stuff. And um, <clears throat> and and the more I read, I, I I came to the realization first of all that young Earth creationism is an actual science, all right. Um, that that people who hold to that don't just sort of say, I don't want to hear the science. This is just what I believe, and that's it. Okay, they actually look at the evidence, and they say, all right, this is what the says. This is the evidence that's there. This is what the fossil, this is what we find in the rocks and, and you know, and all the genes and everything else, all right? And and so what do we, what should we expect to find according to what the Bible says? And, and I looked at it and I thought, you know what? These young earth guys have a pretty good argument. I, I can see where they're coming from. Um, and a lot of it is, it's, it's a matter of how you interpret the evidence. They're looking at the exact same evidence as it is, all right? But it's their understanding of, and a lot of it has to do with, um, with when you pump a whole bunch of water in from a global flood, um, it's going to change what you're going to expect to find. Okay, and so <clears throat> they looked. I, I looked at, at their arguments, and I said these are some pretty decent arguments. Um, but I still, I'm not. I don't see anything really compelling one direction or the other. All right, and one day I was, um, I was reading, 
uh, in the book of Romans. And in find uh, Romans 5, I believe. <clears throat> um, yeah, Romans 5.12. It says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. All right. And I went, wait a minute. That says the death came to all because all sinned. All right. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. All right. And so it hit me that <clears throat> if that's the case, and I believe that that's true, then death is the result of sin. And there would be no death if it weren't for sin. Which is important because um, then that ties in with the, the whole idea of Jesus' death paid for our sin. <clears throat> right? And so if, if, if there was death for millions of years before man came on the scene and sinned, then in that case, death is not the result of sin, and therefore Jesus' death couldn't cover our sin. And so based on that, I said, you know what, this, this means that there couldn't be any death before man uh, came on the scene. Hmm. I would never have thought of that. Well, and that, that was the clincher for me, because I was kind of on the fence. Okay, so, so that was while I was at seminary. And then I, after that, I, I kept reading a lot of Young Earth Creationist stuff. There's an organization called Answers in Genesis um, that uh, you may have heard of. They even have a creation museum uh, down in Kentucky, I think, um, and where they look at the fossils and all that kind of stuff and say, look how this all supports the idea that the Earth is only thousands of years old instead of billions. Okay. And so I was, and, and I, I defended that position very strong, um, and, and, and was very firmly, because of this Romans passage, was very firmly in that case. And about five years ago, I actually wrote a letter to the Lutheran Witness um, along that line, supporting the idea of, of a young earth in response to a, an article that was written, and a sort of question that was left unanswered, and I wrote in to answer that question. Then I got an email t from somebody who read my letter and wrote to me and, and basically said, explain to me, you know, basically convince me of the young earth position. And, um, and so we rolled back and forth and, and he sent me some stuff and, and, and he actually bought some stuff for me and, and ordered it for me and had it sent to me and stuff and, and I looked at some of it and, and I got busy with other things and, and we kind of lost touch um, but then since I knew that I was going to be working on this on this Genesis study I thought I'd better start looking at this stuff and so about six months or so ago I started really looking at um, at this other stuff and now the first thing to understand is when you're trying to nail down exact dates, like um, you may have heard of Bishop Usher, a, a monk that actually he looked at all the different, um, at like this person begat that person, he was this years old and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and he sort of traced things back and nailed down um, the exact, I'm not sure how he pulled this one off, but the exact time and date that man was created. I don't know how he got time. Um, <laughs> even date, I think, is, is really pushing it, where it was like some October something. Um, but, uh, uh, maybe it was, anyway. Um, so, so he kind of figured that out. And, and ever since then, this was like the Middle Ages, ever since then, that's been pretty much the prominent position. Um, but, before that, that wasn't necessarily the case. There were a lot of different perspectives on it. And in fact, if you read the early church fathers, um, well, a little bit later on, you have Augustine. He actually said, why did God need a week? He could have done it all instantly. And Augustine held to the idea that, that 
those <clears throat> six days really kind of happened all at once. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at uh, Irenaeus, who was, um, he was, his teacher was baptized by the Apostle John. A lot of what we know about the early church and like what happened to the apostles and all that kind of stuff was because of Irenaeus. Right? Irene Irenaeus in some of his writings said that that day is not necessarily a day. Not necessarily 24 hours. It could be symbolic. Justin Martyr, another one of our earliest church fathers, also said that's not necessarily a day. Now, there wasn't, if you, if you look through all the different charges and stuff, there's not a lot of discussion on it. Because it wasn't a big deal to them. For us, it's a big deal because of all the science stuff that's going on. All right, but to them it wasn't a big deal. Um, a couple other people, um, Origen, Clement of Alexandria, Thomas Aquinas. Um, these are all people that that said not necessarily 24 hours. All right. This is further complicated by the idea of when you're trying to nail down an exact date that um, we know that in those genies <coughs> where this person begat that person and, and so on. That we've got some parallel genealogies. Um, the book of Numbers, I believe, um, is a listing, and Genesis gives a listing. If you compare them, there's names missing from both of them. Just as with Jesus' genealogies, um, you have two very different lists. Is that because... I'm only thinking of gene, Jesus' genealogy, mm -hmm. but is that because one list is tracing it from Mary and the other from Joseph? You know, that's what I always thought until I actually looked at it in both of them. If you follow it down to the end of the list, um, or the beginning, depending, one starts at the beginning, one starts at the end, but both of them say, and um, have Joseph. Well, are, I don't know if that... So it could be Mary. Are they cousins? I mean, I thought that there was some relation there. Well, but Mary's not mentioned in either one of them. Hmm. They both mention Joseph, but neither one of them mentions Mary. Hmm. So, so what my understanding from that is that when they were listing off genealogies, they weren't like today where when we do a genealogy, we want, you know, we want names and dates and, you know, and and everything so we can chart it all out for them it was the whole point of those genealogies was to show how God cared for his people throughout and how he had a plan and it all fell together and stuff like that the names and dates were really kind of secondary they 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 put enough of that stuff in to say this isn't once upon a time this is real life stuff okay um, these are real people and this isn't we're not just um, you know this isn't in you know and and Kronos gave birth to the gods and you know and, or there's some goofy thing like that all right the point was this is history all right but as far as exact dates they weren't concerned about that um, they were more concerned with sort of general lineages who do you who do you trace your ancestry back to especially for the Jews trace it back to Abraham Isaac and Jacob um, and which tribe are you from and, and things like that so this could only go back to Adam and Eve the, anything before that, like you say, right? Okay, the, the Lord yeah. could have been made a thousand years mm -hmm. apart. Okay, first day, second day. Yeah. All right. And so then, then it, it gets. Then now we will discuss more fully Adam and Eve next time. And next time we will talk about um, apes and hominids and, and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> I'll tell you right now that I firmly believe that Adam and Eve are historical human beings. Um and that they are first human beings, but we'll talk about that more next time. Okay. Um, but what I did find, I, I started reading some writings by a, a scientist um, um, by the name of Hugh Ross, um, and, and he's the head of an organization called Reasons to Believe. Reasons to Believe are, they are old earth creationists. All right. And so what, what, teach is that um, that those days represent a set period of time but not necessarily 24 hours 
and in fact they point to if you're gonna if you're gonna say the Genesis one you have to interpret as um, as day means 24 hours um, it even um, no I don't have it here but it actually in one spot it actually refers to it uses the word day to refer to the entire creation week in Genesis you mean? yeah Genesis 1 um, well okay anyway it, it's, it's there um, <clears throat> if somebody finds it great Okay, so then you get into all these other questions um, about uh, Big Bang and, and things like that. All right, now the way <clears throat> old Earth creation, they say, all right, when you're, and this is um, uh, looking at, did I put the question in here? Did I remove it? Um, it it's the question of um, where is your perspective? All right. Is this being told from God's perspective, sort of outside of the universe looking in? Or is it from the perspective of somebody on the surface of the earth? All right. Which direction are you looking? All right. And, and most people read it because of the prominence of, of sort of the young earth idea, and that most people read it from this sort of looking down and, and, and seeing things happen all right they look at it from the perspective of say you know this were uh, now this was obviously before there were Jews all right because it was before there were people all right but from the perspective of someone who would actually be reading the book of Genesis okay so in the beginning God created light well um, nowadays scientists tell us that um, that in the early days of the earth, according to their understanding of how the earth came together and, and things that originally the atmosphere because of the makeup of it was opaque, was dark and then <clears throat> over time it, it started to lighten up and so then there was light okay and then um, <clears throat> and then you have uh, over time the the sort of mud that was um, the earth separated and um, and, or, and or the, the the atmosphere separated and there's a if anybody's interested I've got a book that, that you can read called that sort of explains this from a scientific perspective um, but it, it talks about the formation of the atmosphere and, and things and that and that by the time you get to day four is when you have the planets well if you sort of follow chronologically of, of the scientific understanding of or the sort of old earth understanding of um, of the development of, of the earth it was much later that the um, that the atmosphere was transparent enough that you could actually see the heavenly bodies out there and so they're saying that this perspective is um, you know somebody on that's on earth looking up that at some point oh look there's specific heavenly bodies out there it's not just this sort of white blur Right. And um, <clears throat> and so they sort of follow through those, and they say, you know what? If you line this stuff up, it actually it, it actually holds together. And there's other passages that talk about um, the, in the Psalms that talk about God spreading out the universe, which they say, well, that's a reference to the Big Bang. That it's it's referring to the universe expanding. And um, and so it's a, it's a really interesting perspective, and, and it's it's one that I find very compelling. Um, and 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 I, I really started to I, I when I started reading this stuff, I I went into it looking for the flaw in it. All right, I'm still looking at it, and I haven't found a flaw yet. And I was reading it as a theologian, looking for where does this contradict the Word of God? All right, because these are not people that say we believe in science, and so let's make the Bible match it. All right. And He's, you're saying this is for old Earth creation? Yes. All right. Now, there are besides young Earth creation and old Earth creation. Um, there's lots of other. In fact, old Earth creation—that's one perspective. 
there's others too. There's other um, ideas of um, of of creation, how you interpret um, these six days and, and things like that. Um, you have what's called gap uh, creation that um, that God created the heavens and the earth and and um, and and then there's like this 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 gap somewhere in there where where some stuff happened and then there was like a whole bunch of other stuff that that Moses didn't mention when he wrote Genesis and then all of a sudden you know man comes on the scene or, or something like that um, or that or sort of taking this God created the heavens and the earth and then much later on all this other stuff happened um, there's also um, uh, see the last one on the list your functional creation. And, and that's the idea. And th this one I, th I thought was kind of compelling too, but it, it, it has some flaws. Um, that and the idea with this one is that the um, the the word here that we translate created um, is created more in the sense of giving function to the way that you create a committee. Um, and where where God assigned function for our benefit, which I found it a compelling argument just because it focuses on the verb, it focuses on the action instead of the thing, right? The Hebrew way of thinking is to focus on the action, not the thing. Um, focusing on the thing and sort of focusing on the sort of the process. That's a Greek way of thinking, which that's the 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 way of thinking that we've sort of inherited. Um, in our in our culture in our society, um, but that's not the way that that Hebrews think. They think very differently. Um, just as an example of that, the name Yahweh, Jehovah, I Am. Um, we take that because we think about the thing. We say, oh, that means God exists, as opposed to all the other false gods that don't really exist. All right. Well, that's implied, but but really, the focus for for in Hebrew is is on the action, not just I exist, but I am with you. I am helping you. I am caring for you. I am there for you. I am the vine. I yeah. am the bread. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and so, no, it certainly has that concept of existing. And in fact, Jesus <clears throat> kind of used that where they said, "How could you know Abraham?" And he said, "Before Abraham was, I am." Mm -hmm. All right. So sort of play on words there. Um, but it has this kind of functional thing now. I sent a note when I was reading um, a book on this this functional creation. Um, I sent a note to this Reasons to Believe organization, the older guys, and said, "How do you guys respond to this?" And um, and just today, actually, I got an email uh, from someone from there, and um, and I just wanted to read you a little bit uh, from that. Um, He's, and the, the name of the book is The Lost World of Genesis 1. Um, <clears throat> and, and he actually explains this better than I did. He says uh, the name of the guy that wrote it is, he's the professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College. His name is Dr. John Walton. Um, Walton's main thesis is that Genesis 1 describes a functionality of creation rather than a material one. The distinction between his approach and ours is that uh, each of the first three days of creation describes each element, time, weather, and food. Um, and in relation to the way that the ancients would have thought of creation as function. Um, and so um, in the succeeding three days, functionaries are installed which operate on that order. So once you have time, then you have you know the planets that sort of mark out the time and the stars and things. Um, you have uh, what was thinking that weather, and then you have sort of the the, the creatures that that live within weather and that, and then and then the third thing you have vegetation, dry land, and that, and then you have the stuff that eats that stuff, um, and lives in that, and which is that model is important if you look at the six days, and you line them up, one two three, and then next to it four five six you have light, and then the stuff that gives off light. Planets, moons, sun, stars, whatever. Um, you have, then you have um, the the sky and the sea, the waters above and the waters below in a sense, atmosphere. 
right? And then you have fish and birds. Stuff that lives in the sky and the sea. And then you have dry land and vegetation. And you have um, the things that live on the dry land. Animals and people. Right? So, so there is a pattern. The question is, how do we understand that pattern? Um, so uh, he can uh, he says then his understanding is on the seventh day enters the temple that he has created has become the home of God a sort of control room the creation days become not a kind of material creation but the establishment of the cosmic temple and its functions um, he says there are several problems with that first we must take into account that there are two revelations the general revelation the created order and special revelation the biblical record all right what he's talking about here is the idea that we can learn a lot from God just by looking around, all right? Just by looking at the universe, all right? And, and wow, what an amazing God we have. Um, we can see that, that God is, um, is orderly. We can see that, you know, we can, we can look at, at the movements of the planets around the stars and, and the, the movements of the galaxies, and we can see God's an artist. We look at flowers, and, and, and I, I look at the deer running through the yard. And Eating <laughs> my grapes. <laughs> they eat our bird seed. But they're still beautiful yeah. animals. All right? Eating my corn. <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, you can look at a blade of grass and look at the intricacy of that blade of grass and all of the different things working together, and you say, what an amazing God we have. All right? And, um, and so... And then we also look at the Bible and, and the information that's there. And, and now, our interpretation, all right, we can interpret both of them wrongly, okay? But both of them, God's creation, God's not going to lie in his creation, all right? And this is one of the really compelling old earth arguments that I found, all right? And this is the question of, all right, stars that are billions of light years away, that we can see through, you know, some of them we can only see through, like, the Hubble telescope and stuff like that, okay? If they're billions of light years away, that means it takes billions of years for that light to get here, all right? So, but I always looked at that argument and said, ah, but God created light first. And so he could create, okay, he creates a star, he, and, and here's Earth, and he already has light, so he can just sort of, you know, there's the beam of light, you know, and to connect them so that we can see that thing that's far away. All right. The problem is we're not what we see now is not just a point of light. With telescopes and things like that, we can see all going on out there. We can see we can see stars forming inside of nebulae. And and just all kinds of amazing things going on out there. Which we get that and say what an amazing God we have! I mean, we um, I took my family to the um, science center, and they had this space thing, this Hubble telescope thing on the Omnimax, right? And they're showing all this stuff. And I'm like, wow. God is incredible! You know, it just gives you a real appreciation, right? But the thing is, if that stuff's so far away, and we're seeing that stuff, and if it takes light that long to get here, right? If God put the light there. We're not just seeing light, we're seeing things happening. So the question is, when did those things happen? If it takes light that time to get here, if you sort of follow it back, you're not looking at present, you are looking into the past. And the young earth creationists always say, you know what, all we have is the present. All we can do is look at, at what we have, fossil record and things like that, and how we understand that. The old earth creationists say, well, actually, as soon as you step outside of the earth, what we have is the past. We don't have the present. We don't really know what's going on out there um, because we can't see what's happening right now. All we can mm -hmm. see is what happened when the light left that on its way here. And so their argument is, if you either, if if that's if if we're seeing all that stuff happening and our measurements of those things being that far away are accurate, then if, if those things didn't really happen as long ago as we think they did because of our understanding of the speed of light, then 
God lied and he's saying he's telling us by showing us these things that this stuff happened all this time ago but it really didn't and we know that God doesn't lie and that's a thinker <laughs> right so so that is based though on the understanding that all of our scientific information regarding this speed of light and all of this is correct right and so to me there's still a little room for wiggle right right and that's the thing what I'm trying to do is, is and I okay I've got a bias everybody does okay um, and this this was really hard for me when it hit me because I supported firmly vehemently I mean I I put my neck online and and, and supported the young earth position for over a decade all right I taught kids in information class to stand up to their teachers <laughs> <laughs> and 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 write on their when they're when they wrote out their their tests um, and, and the teacher asks you how old is is the earth or something like that you know that you say well this is what the Bible says but this is the answer that you're looking for you know <laughs> all right then I started reading this other it's and the problem is old earth creation is not you generally have what in Christian circles either young earth creation or theistic evolution which sort of takes the whole evolution thing and just says, well, God directed it. Hmm. All right. Old Earth creation sits in the middle. And one of the big differences is they say there are definite periods. Because, and in fact, what we find in the fossil record is, while it's not a 24-hour period, it's a period of millions of years, you have what they call these, these explosions, these biological explosions where there's there's like there's nothing you, you go back in the fossil record at a certain point there's nothing and all of a sudden boom there's all sorts of life all over the place in the oceans it appears in the fossil record out of nowhere all right you go a little further and there's not a lot of change very minor changes and then all of a sudden boom you have an explosion where all of a sudden there's much more complex life and there's no sort of transition from one to the next you just all of a sudden you know you, you go from like I'm, I'm I may be oversimplifying this but you go from like bacteria to fish not sort of like complex bacterial cluster something like mm -hmm. that and in fact when fish come on the scene you have things like elobites um, which have these these eyes that the lens of the eye is so complex that there's there's two different species of trilobites that they found all right while while the um, the paleobiologists were studying trilobites the um, the optical doctors and that um, that were studying lenses and, and things like that and so they could design telescopes and and, and, and glasses and all kinds of things there's two specific ways that you can form a lens that will cause light to um, that no matter where you no matter where you look it's always focused right? there's two different ways to do it but it has to be precise in order for that to work all right there's two different species of trilobites each one of them has one of those kinds of lenses in its eyes hmm. So you have these things, these trilobites appearing out of nowhere. There's no sort of pre-trilobite, <laughs> right? It just shows up, and it's got these ridiculously complex eyes that are perfectly formed to be able to focus at any distance. On oh, trilobite eyes are like flies' eyes, so they have multiple ones. So they're just insanely complex, and boom, there they are. And and the same thing, it keeps going like that. That you have these sort of these stages sort of works out to you can actually nail it down sort of six days of where you look at these these different explosions I, I so I, I read about this and I thought, wow how do the evolutionists explain this one because evolution is supposed to be sort of a steady 
um, mm -hmm. kind of thing? And their answer is, we don't know. <laughs> and they come up with all kinds of, well, maybe evolution doesn't work the way we thought it did. Maybe it, it sort of goes in spurts. Or maybe, maybe there was some sort of weird radiation that just happened every so often or, or something like that. Um, and meanwhile, the more we look at, at things like um, what it takes, there was a, a planet that was just, it's been in the news over the past few weeks that they discovered on some distant star. Um, well, now they're questioning whether it exists or not. Because the way that they, they can't see the planets because it's so far away, they can actually see how the star wobbles a little bit. Mm from the gravity of the planet rotating around it or uh, orbiting around it and 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 so then they can they can learn a lot from other like how the light affected and all kind of stuff and they can tell a lot about and so there's this planet that that showed up um, and uh, and and they said this planet is very similar um, to earth well it's actually like three <coughs> times the size of earth um, but it probably has water on it and said so, well if there's water then there must be life all right well first of all this planet it's it's what's called tidally locked which means that it's like mercury that one side always faces the star mm -hmm. and the other side is always away so so yeah you're gonna have this sort of temperate zone in the middle this sort of you know ring where it's not too hot and not too cold um, but it's not gonna be steady there's going to be fluctuation, which means it's going to be really hard for anything to survive in that sort of environment. But actually, there's actually dozens of characteristics that has to do with its magnetic field and all kinds of other things that have to be exactly right for life to be able to survive on that. And much less to survive while, but actually to develop... Um, according to, to the ideas to, to for actu to have actual complex life the way we think of beyond just like bacteria or something like that everything has to be perfect the 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 age of the planet relative to the star the age of the star relative to the galaxy the um and like the earth you start to look at it the earth formed if you follow the the time frames that were given the Earth formed at just the right time, and life appeared on Earth at just the right time. And say that. and the Earth has just the right characteristics. You need a lot more than just liquid water on. Them. And and in fact, now they have discovered something like I think it's 400 planets so far outside of of um, of our solar system. And so far, not one of them is even close to being able to support life. That's why they're so excited. One, they said, we finally found one that could have liquid water on it. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's boiling on one side and frozen on the other. And, you know, and you'd have all kinds of crazy, you know, weather patterns and stuff that there's no way anything could survive on that. I mean, even if, if we could go there and try to set up some sort of, you know, water world thing there or something like that, there's, you, you survive on it. And um, and so, you know, all the 400 planets so far, and not one of them is going to be able to support life. So um, so we're at time, and um, and we'll talk a little more about the image of God because it's important. Just um, we'll talk about that a little bit next time, and uh, and and maybe we'll hit on a couple of these other ones anyway um, if we can jump into them in discussion with Adam and a lot of these have to do with with man um, so I want you to oh oh one other thing that we should mention is this seventh day idea all right seventh day God rested okay what is different about that seventh day but the fact that God wasn't creating on that day what is different in the way it's described than any of the other day what is it missing the other ones <clears throat> there was evening and there was morning the first day there was evening and morning the mm, second day mm -hmm. seventh day no evening oh. that one's different 
right? You just stay laid on the whole time. Well, yeah, I mean, you don't have this, this ending. Now, in, in Jewish thought, the day begins and ends at sundown, evening, right? Um, and so, uh, which is, by the way, is why Christmas Eve is technically Christmas. Um, but, uh, so, so there's no evening here. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of theologians throughout the history of the church mm -hmm. have understood this as we're living in the seventh day. Mm -hmm. Um, now you get into the book of Hebrews and there's a reference to Hebrews 4. Um, if you don't have time to look that up, I encourage you to, to check that out. Um, Jesus talks a lot about the Sabbath. Um, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Um, and, and he talks about that. And Hebrews 4 actually talks about Jesus is our Sabbath. He is our Sabbath rest. Um, and the, and so, so the argument that we are living in the seventh day. Um, it's the time where, where God has stopped his creation. He is with his people. Um, where, where, and our Christ is our Sabbath. Uh, others have interpreted as the sixth day was sort of to when Jesus came. When Jesus came, that's the seventh day. And in the early church, there was there was also this idea of that because remember Sabbath is Saturday, right? And we go to church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. That that they would refer to Sunday as the Lord's day. But there's also some places where they refer to it as the eighth day. Oh. Because all right, we know what God did on the, on the first seven days. The eighth day is the day of resurrection. All right which would also refer to um, to the second coming of Christ, the eighth day, the new era. So, um, so, so I hope that after this discussion um, that, you know, you're not going to tar and feather me or anything like that. I hope I give you some things to think about, right? Um, if you sort of during the week, if, um, if you sort of go, oh what about this or whatever feel free to bring it in. um and uh and 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 so if you if if you by your reading if you say you know what i see a young earth here fine great read it and you say no i see an old earth here great all right oh i almost forgot this romans passage if you go back to that Romans 5 passage, because that was always the clincher. I didn't care what science said, because the Bible's never wrong. All right? This was the thing that really sort of knocked me off my pedestal. All right? I went back and I read this Romans passage again. Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death came to all men, because all sin. Notice there, it says death came to all men, mm -hmm. human beings. This passage does not refer to animals dying. So according to the Romans, you could have animals dying for billions of years, or thousands of years, or a day, okay, before sin came into the world. You can't have human beings dying. But you can't have animals dying before sin came into the world. Could you have them not dying as well? Yes, you could. Okay. <laughs> you know, there's so many things where I wish just given us a textbook, not a bunch of stories and poems and things like that, <laughs> and laid it out for us. But that's because I think like Greek. All right. But the Bible is written um, by Hebrew. Meant to be understood by all. That meant meant animals. to be understood by all. Absolutely. Right. All right. But it's important that as we look at it, we look at it and we say, how did how did they understand it? All right. But they necessarily understood it properly, and, and we need to keep that in mind too. But we have to ask the question, how would they have understood it? And we also have to ask the question, and I think this is the more important question, is why did God give us this? Why did he give us Genesis 1 the way he did? Was it for the purpose of giving us a chronology? You know, one of my concerns about the old earth creation, where they tie it all in with Big Bang and everything like that, I don't think God was trying to give us a, um, you know, sort of lay out a, 
a quick synopsis of of the Big Bang and the and primordial Earth. What benefit is that to us? All right. So that's one of my concerns about about that look. But then again, that's also how young Earth creationists look at it. And um, and so they have to ask, okay, there's more going on here than just a question of how old is Earth and what happened in those days before mankind was seen. Yeah, the whole time I'm thinking, Jesus said, this is my body, and this is my blood. It's pretty simple. That's when I read, on the first day, you know, and he did this, it was the <coughs> evening, and it was morning and evening, and he said it was good. It's very simple. And so, right. Yep. And that's and that's a a very good valid argument for but a young position. I think about the scripture that says that to God one day can be as a thousand years, and a thousand years can be as one day. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Now. That's it. The 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 cool thing about this either way is whether you hold to like the Big Bang or not, right? Where did the Big Bang come from? Where did this you know sort of thing that was supposed to be like the size of an atom that exploded into the whole universe. Where'd that come from? Nothing. It came from nothing. And in fact, if all right, if that's true, if the, if that's the way things started out, all right, how did it start out? What 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 kicked it into gear? Here's the problem with it. All right. Part of this idea is not just that all of the matter in the universe expanded out but that space and time itself was part of that expansion, that space and time did not exist before that, which is kind of hard for us to understand because we live in space and time. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that before that, there wasn't even such a thing as space and time as we know it. Okay. And so if um, uh, Stephen Hawking recently said, well, because there's such a thing as gravity and, and, and other forces in the universe, we know... Uh, you know how things came into being. Ah, but none of those forces existed before the Big Bang. And that's why light years might not be what we think of. All right, and I'm not enough of a physicist to be Me able either. to explain that. Um, I lost right. my life. I'm trying to understand it. But <laughs> all right, but the problem is none of those forces that we look at to try to explain the Big Bang, none of those forces existed at that moment. And so we can't explain it. Nobody can explain it. There, and so the everybody agrees, no matter what your position on any of this is, that in order for the universe to exist, there must be something outside of the universe that brought it into existence. So with the Big Bang, when they first came up with this theory, the atheists didn't like it. They said the universe has to have always existed. Because as soon as you bring it into existence, something had to cause it to come into existence. They've been struggling with that ever since. All right? Because that means there's something outside the universe. And we say, oh, yeah, the Bible says that when Jesus ascended into heaven, he went beyond the heavens. We've always known there was something outside the universe. Now they're just getting to that point. They're saying, ah, welcome aboard, you know. <laughs> so, um, so it's just, you know, all this stuff is fascinating. You can really dig into the science of it and stuff like that. You don't have to. All right? Um, but I, th I think one thing I have learned from struggling with this is that um, we need to be quick, or, or, or rather not be quick, to sort of judge people and say, well, they hold to this position because they don't respect the Bible or, or something like that. Okay, that's not true. Um, in, in certain cases it is. Okay, but... A lot of the stuff I've read, people hold the Bible up as say, the Bible's the word of God. All right. Does Doctor Heck be that I understand from his He is a young earth creationist. Younger. I thought he agreed with everything. <laughs> I told Larry I liked his outline because it agreed with everything. <laughs> and and and, and while Doctor Heck and I would would disagree probably on like maybe two, three chapters and we'll we'll kinda hit on some of those as we go through this. Um, for the most part, you know, he and I are right in line, right? Um, you know, and 
So I'm, I'm not a, a flaming liberal or, you know, or anything like that. Um, <laughs> I was, I was, when it, when I first started to, to read this stuff and realized that, that this was a viable position, um, it really made me uncomfortable. I feel like if, if anybody's ever seen the movie The Matrix, um, I felt like I'd taken that pill where all of a sudden everything is completely different. It was it was very un because I was very comfortable in in where I was at, where you know I was it was the status quo and and everything. And then I went, oh man, I've got to I, I've got to start over, you know. And it could change again for you. And it could. Because you're young. Yeah. Right. And and that's the other thing. And that's why I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> this is the proper understanding of of the age of the universe. Like right? you used to. Huh? I used to. <laughs> and I found out that not necessarily. Right? So I've learned that now there are certain things that I will very firmly hold to. And being historical people that I will hold to and we'll talk about that more next time. Um but uh you know there are certain things that we absolutely have to hold to. And of course everything in the New Testament. Most of the Old Testament, you know, I mean, obviously the Psalms when it says the mountains and the trees will break forth into singing and all the trees will clap their hands. Yeah, that's poetry. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and so it's not even a matter of t whether you take it literally or not, but, um, you know, how do you, how do you take it literally? You know, and so, all right. I've gone way so over. man will never know this, right? Well, I mean... Yeah, I mean, us on Earth will never know how it, for sure. You can only go uh, back so far. It yeah. seems like. Yeah, yeah. All exactly. the theories are just they hit this wall. And yeah, from they here hit up, this wall. We can't go nowhere. Right, right, and that's why they can. They, you know, the the astronomers say we can get almost back to the Big Bang, but not quite there. And 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 then we we sort of hit this wall and can't get past that to get all the way back to the beginning of it, because you can only get so far as where you actually had those laws in, of physics and things like that in place. And we, we can't, you know, get past that. And, um, and so, or, uh, you know, if you're younger, um, you know, then it's even harder because then you're, you're looking at, um, well then, in a sense, you can say, well, I go all the way back to God said, let there be light, or, you know, or, or however you understand those first um, two verses. Okay. So um, even in those first two verses, you already have the Spirit of God over the water, so you already have water there, um, you know. So then you get, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. All right. All right. So any, any other questions before we close? I think, uh, uh, were the animals here bef uh, first before any, anything? Well, we know that the animals were here before man. No matter which yeah. position you hold to, God created the animals before man. Now, you know what he created when you know that's where the that's where yeah. some of the, the arguments start that's what it goes with the fossils and stuff that we're finding but dinosaurs being how many millions of years actually right. before christ right whereas and and um whereas young earth creationists would say that there were dinosaurs on the ark right and um and I've got a great children's book at home that <laughs> shows the pictures and everything Read it yeah. to my kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, all right. Anything else? Let's close the prayer. Heavenly Father, your ways are not our ways. Uh, you are so much wiser than, than us, and, and you've given us your word and, and revealed yourself to us, but we still have a hard time with it. It's not because there's any problems with the word, but it's because there's problems with our minds. And um, so we pray that you open our minds and, and uh, hold us firmly rooted in your word. And, and um, but in this, to to think you've given us minds to, to think about the all of the things that, that you've done, help us to see your glory in creation, to recognize the love that you show to us through all of the blessings that that you've given to us, and. Um, enable us uh, through faith to rejoice in those blessings and especially we thank you for the blessing of life that you've given us in Jesus Christ the promise of eternal life 
uh, that even if we do figure out everything in this creation, you're going to destroy it all and, and start over from scratch anyway. So uh, just keep us in that true faith until that day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Just so you know, Pastor, no matter Pepper and Genesis, I will never believe that stuffed animals are made out of dead things. They're <laughs> <laughs> made out of dead things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah.